the Crude Audacity Podcast. listening to the crude audacity podcast the podcast that talks shop shit and of course all things strategy with oil patch influencers i am Catherine mills and before we kick it off today wherever you are listening from go ahead and leave us a rate and review and if you are watching on youtube go ahead and hit that little subscribe button below for me that way you can stay up to date on all things oil energy and of course the crude audacity And as always, thank you so much for your engagement. I love seeing your questions, seeing your reviews on our influencers. It's great to hear how our episodes are resonating with you in industry. And I know our influencers love to hear your feedback as well. So today I have a very special guest. I actually um, am a little hesitant to share him with all of y'all because he is one of my greatest mentors. And I quite frankly, don't want everyone to know how good he is. So (laughs) <laughs> B. Alui, welcome to the Crude Audacity podcast. Thanks, Catherine. Well, B, you and I, we have been, uh, we worked together for about a year. You've been one of my greatest mentors. I love shooting the shit with you and really talking about what's happening across the oil patch. So today I honestly thought we would do the same and addressing some of these articles that are coming out. And since we are in an election year, really dr- addressing sort of the pivots that are happening in industry, um, I don't really want to hit on the COVID-19 or the black swan events. I feel like everyone's sick of hearing about it. Everyone gets it. But kind of where we're headed, because I know you have uh, the secret sauce of insight. But before we uh, kick everything off, will you give us your background, how you started in oil and gas, and really how you ascended to the role and responsibilities that you have today, and why you put up with me? <laughs> um, my story is pretty boring. It's not the typical oil and gas type guy. I No influencer has a typical story. <laughs> I started with Schlumberger in 2005. My assignment, my first assignment was in uh, Algeria. So prior to that, I finished from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, studied electrical and electronics engineering. And um, I really wanted to do wireline. Why? Doesn't that seem like, did you grow up thinking I'm going to be a wireline guy? Not really. (laughs) (laughs) But I wanted to be in the oil field and I felt the, um, I guess one of the courses I liked most was sensors and measurements overlaid well with wireline but at my schlumberger interview i guess the recruiters felt this guy's better at fracturing <laughs> up with fracturing so my first assignment was in uh, algeria i was in algeria for three years in the field went through the field engineer training to become a gfe um that's general field engineer for old schlumberger ends <laughs> i feel what it's called uh then i got transferred across the border to tunisia tunisia okay yeah yeah i lived in tunis for two years very beautiful city i guess it's interesting when you live in a touristic city you wake up in the morning people going to work and people head to the beach you feel left alone (laughs) but yeah it was fun did some offshore work some desert work there as well and then i moved to germany I think uh, my assignment in Germany is probably the most interesting because I got to see a lot of countries in Central Europe. And there are countries where you wouldn't expect to see hydraulic fracturing. But at the time, that's 2010, 2012, I guess fracturing got banned effectively in Germany in 2012. Why? And mainly environmental reasons. Yeah, activists. Yes, yes. But uh, there's some really good reservoirs in Germany um, where we could where we could get good oil and gas at relatively economic prices compared mm-hmm. to just importing. But that's the direction it's gone. And um, I'd say we've probably not seen the end of oil yet in Europe. 
But the truth is Europe is moving more towards renewables in terms of energy sources, right? And they promote it, but on the back end, if you actually do your research, it's towards coal. Right. <laughs> and what's what's been reported is that the use of renewables is the highest in terms of the sources of energy consumers go for. And I think it's a I think it's a decent narrative to follow. We can all go towards renewables. Mm -hmm. But the transition needs to be a careful one because we don't want to jump into a source that's so expensive. To the consumer, it might appear cheap, but like you said, it's been there's a lot of um, rebates to renewable companies, right? Renewable energy providers, such that you end up paying for it through taxes. Mm -hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. So, okay, from Germany, where'd you go? From Germany, I came to Canada. Canada for seven years, and now I'm in Houston. So while in Canada, so all, all through to Germany, I worked at Schlumberger. When I moved to Canada, I joined Baker Hughes. I was at Baker Hughes for nine months. And um, I worked with the pressure pumping department there, which was essentially a metamorphosis from BJ buying Nowsco, Baker Hughes taking over BJ in Baker Hughes pressure pump in Canada. So I moved out of there to work with collaboratories. I worked as a regional engineering advisor for Protechnics. And that's where I got into tracing, um, fleet tracers, oil and gas tracers. Uh, we tried steam tracing, radioactive, radioactive propens to calculate fracture, perforation efficiency, ETC. And then I joined a reservoir solutions group at Sanjel, where I met my current boss. Okay. I was at Sanjel until we, until the 2014 downturn, Sanjel eventually filed for CCAA in Canada in 2016. And then reservoir solutions group, and I worked for them in Canada for a bit and just moved to Houston last year. Why did you miss uh, Colorado? I guess I wanted something different, something closer to the warmth. Yeah, I know, right? How's Houston working out for you? It's very humid. <laughs> yeah. So B, how many continents and countries have you actually fracked on? Africa, Europe, Asia, North America. Four. Four. Yeah, four. Most never see that in their career. Yeah, that's a, I guess that's a difference with hydraulic fracturing overseas as compared to North America. And this has always been there. So the pace, the pace in North America is very, very quick. Mm -hmm. Overseas, you can, you don't have the opportunity to get it wrong. Explain so, that because I don't, I don't know that North America has necessarily gotten it right. There's room for experimentation in North America. There was room for experimentation when things started, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the innovation came from. That's where hydraulic fracturing was invented, right? It all started out of, it was accidental. It wasn't like someone went out there and said, if I do this, I can crack the rock and drain. Mm -hmm. One accidentally dumped a ton of fluid into a well. And, oh, okay, I can keep doing this, right? And then when it came to shale fracking, it started in North America as well. But it's not because we decided shale is the next thing. We essentially have run out of conventional oil and gas onshore. Well, we moved away from development planning. I don't know that we ran out of it. We just didn't want to get creative, especially when we let the money come in and we realized that IP30 to IP90 could make you a fast buck. We're actually seeing a push back towards conventionals and really getting into the science of it. Right, but you can't you can't compare the quality of the conventional we have right now. I call it American conventional. It's not what's in the Middle East. It's not what's in South America, and it sure as hell isn't what it is in Canada. Exactly, and it's not. Yeah, it's not what you have in the Gulf of Mexico as well. <laughs> we don't see Darcy rocks anymore. We hardly see Millie Darcy rocks. We talk in micro Darcy's now. Nano. Nano Darcy's. 
I always think it's weird when people talk in micro Darcy's. I'm like, that's too damn big. What are you talking about? Exactly. Right. And yet most of my clients now are Darcy. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned uh, offshore there. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion offshore is steadily grown over the last decade and people don't quite realize it. It is, it is a hush hush situation. I almost wonder with all of these pivots that are happening, if offshore might be a rebirth of a frontier for oil and gas. Um, offshore never disappeared. Offshore has mm -hmm. always been there. It's always grown. Well, um, Macondo caused a lot of, true. Uh, true. a lot of like, hold on, we're going to slow our roll for a moment, if, if you will. I think the thing with offshore is, uh, well, it's obvious the investment you need for offshore is way higher than what you need for onshore. Intense higher. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it normally will grow slower than onshore where you just, you can keep going bang, bang with uh, a much relatively smaller amount of money. You could develop an entire pad and you're still working on infrastructure offshore. Mm. So I guess that's the difference. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't grow as fast, but it will steadily grow. Production will steadily grow as well. Is that something that people need to sort of keep one ear to the ground about? Well, I think a, um, a well-rounded petroleum engineer should be able to do both offshore and onshore. So you should. It's hard to get those jobs though. Because there are few. Okay. Yeah, those jobs are much fewer than what you have onshore, and the 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 volume is also much lower. Like you probably do one frack and pack a month offshore. Yeah, and I'm sure you would have fracked six hundred wells with tons and tons of sand in them. So the they're totally different. You could almost say they're totally different industries. But a well-rounded petroleum engineer should be able to feed into either space. I'll just add it to my resume and hope it works out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's very easy to trip up offshore. I know, right? So, yeah. you know, there is such a misconception around the frack industry itself. Mm -hmm. And even recently, we saw Schlumberger and Liberty uh, um, combine in one way or another. Um, there are a lot of opinions that are out there right now about it. And I just find it interesting. So we're in the age of consolidation. I don't want to beat a dead horse with these black swans. Everyone gets it. But, you know, what is happening to the frack industry? And then, as I like to say, it's frack fluid, not unicorn tears. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone seems to want to attack that, especially being an election year. But Yet fracking is why they our presidents have success, you know? So what are you seeing? You've got pretty good, you know, insider trading on these things. <laughs> so I'll, I'll encourage everyone to go to frackfocus.org and just um, look at what's actually inside the frack fluids and look at what percentage. The same stuff that's in toothpaste. <laughs> yeah, and it's... The concentration is is much lower, uh, and I think everything in excess is bad, right? So if you go oh, ahead, yeah, that's the level of toxicity, right? Water and milk can be bad at certain levels. True. If you go ahead and drink a ten GPT load of gel, you'll hurt yourself. <laughs> it won't kill you, but you'll hurt yourself. Yeah. Right, but at the concentrations that things are being pumped, it's essent the the frack fluid itself is essentially harmless. And you 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 touched on um, collaboration and consolidation. So when I look at the, I, I worked at Schlumberger for about eight years. Best so you know life. all the dirty little secrets. Well, I I, I always saw Schlumberger as a technology company. That's what they claim to be. That's what their marketing is. Yeah, but I think when hydraulic fracturing took over the market, everyone chased it for the cash flow. I don't necessarily see a huge margin of profitability in 
the hydraulic fracturing business. There's a lot of cash flow in it, but the margins are much lower mm-hmm. as compared to other segments like drilling, wireline. If you just just think about it, a wireline truck has got three people on it, maybe two, and you got tools, and you go out run a log, and you're back in one day. And you can only use the wire line for X amount of runs. Exactly. You can keep going with the same tool as long as you don't lose it. Mm-hmm. Compare that to frack and just, just look at the setup you have on site and the consumables you use. So it, it um, the frack business becomes a volume business. The more you do, the more money you make, the more profit you have. Right. So... I, I see the Schlumberger stick and stake in Liberty as Schlumberger going back more into the back room of developing technology that would support this industry. Yeah, because they didn't want to get rid of it. They asked for, what was it, 30-something percent? Like, we still want it. We just don't want the upfront responsibility of it. Yeah, I see it, I see it as, a, as, as a smart move, though, because you just get, you, you get to share the profit. But you provide the technology and help because see, I think maybe Schlumberg accepted that Liberty can frack better than we can. Liberty has a unique model. Exactly. Yes. And it and huh. I think in, in this age of consolidation, we all need to look inside and look fine. What's what's my what's my strength? Liberty does not have the research and development capacity that Schlumberg has had access to. Mm-hmm. Right. So if everyone looks at their strengths and work together, I guess we can all win. And that's that's the way I see this situation. Like there's another um, I know uh, Schlumberger has licensed some of their cementing technologies out to other service companies, because in those businesses, Schlumberger on its own can run a cementing company that will be profitable. Like they just different segments. So I provide technology. You go use it and give me a cut. It's a win-win. Who do you think initiated the conversation? Like, come on. I, I little, a little bit of me thinks that Slumberger was like, hey, Liberty, you, you want this shit? It would be more like you want you want this gold. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the G <laughs> word, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's an, it's an opportunity for, for both companies. I, I hope Schlumberger will um, train Liberty engineers. Do the small frat companies survive? The little mom and pops that are out there, the the one offs. I mean, Liberty has competitors, a handful of them at least. Um, does this merger, this collaboration, uh, move towards the elimination of them, especially with the reduction in frat crews we've seen over the last six to eight months? Um, not necessarily. I think what will be the game changer, and I think that's probably one of the things. Well, in my opinion, one of the things that that will drive uh, Schlumberger's move because over the last, I'd say five years, I've not really seen any new technology come out. We're, we're, we're using the same thing and recycling the same ideas and just testing it on the same rocks. Well, so that's a big we- problem we're having in industry right now because we've got all these people that are thinking it's downturn. It's my turn to shine. I'm going to go chase this capital, but really they're not, um, they're not thinking outside the box to your point. They're not looking for a new opportunity. They're, they're doing the same business plan and claiming they can do it better than the previous guy. But the reality is, did we really do it better? I mean, seriously, conventional or unconventional, did we really do it better? So it's, it's very difficult to step aside and think about technology when you're very busy especially if you're in a business where one move could cost you a lot. Your margins are already very slim, right? So you have to really focus on execution and it's, it's really tough to, I think it's, I think it's tough to do both. And that's why Schlumberger will step back and focus on the technology. And back to your point about the mom and pop, I think what will be the game changer is a new technology, a new innovative way of fracturing is developed by someone and the early adopters will take the win. I think Liberty leverage and Schlumberger's technology, Schlumberger comes up with something, they get first pick, right? So 
that sets them up to knock out a lot of competition as long as they can extract more value from the ground than everybody else. But as of right now, it's difficult to kick anyone out because we're all doing the same thing. We all have the same suppliers. Mm-hmm. It's the same frat, get pump schedules. The pumps are all the same. The blenders are all the same. If only we all owned our own sand mines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that be, seems to be the secret, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's the, I guess that's the, that's the other way. It's either you, it's either you own the technology or you own the commodity, which is the sand. Yeah, but to your point, even in the tech space, I mean, like looking at the operator space, sure, you're not, we're not evolving. We're all chasing behind pipe because that seems to be the nature of the business. But even in the tech space, I can't say, to your point, I can't say I've seen anything groundbreaking. Right. You know, yeah. there's, just, there's just the claim that we've improved. Yeah. So like when I walked to Schlumberge, we had something called NT5, which is new technology developed in the last five years. And that's what you push. And it did work because it drove you to drove the company to research and develop new things. And it drove you as a field engineer to find ways to use the new technology. Like I pumped clear frack. Clear frack is a viscoelastic surfactant that leaves zero damage. Like that wouldn't work in shield though, but we have to come up with something like that for shield, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I think the we need innovation, and in order to innovate, we need someone to focus on it. We need mavericks. Yes. Well, you know, fracking is leading. Fracking is a hot button topic right now. It's resurfacing because of the election. We're seeing it on the forefront of, I mean, seriously, if Biden says one more time that he's immediately going to ban fracking and then he gets on a plane or remains warm in his basement, you know, to each their own. But what it's leading to is a new discussion on flaring in West Texas. And You know, in comparison to Colorado, we have closed loop systems up here. They are not cheap. They are incredibly innovative. And yet we are under siege up here. When you go down to West Texas, flaring is a real problem. It's it's one of the leaders that in the Bakken, you know, they've got their issues, their old equipment, old systems. But people think we're just doing it for the heck of it. And the reality behind it is that they're really leasing agreements that are driving the production requirements that require a, you know, a a certain amount of flaring at one time or another. So what is your take before we really get into the meat of it? Because some interesting things came out today, article wise, and they'll be below in the show notes. But Flaring and fracking and all of those bad words that, God, the media loves them. So my my take, I I personally don't. I I consider flaring for operations to be legit as long as it's required. I um I I don't subscribe to waste. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter where it's coming from, right? So flaring gas, flaring BCFs of gas to get a few million barrels of oil. I think it's I think it's wasteful if that's the way it's that's the way it's been reported. Um, I did some of my own research a few years back, and it's true. Um, in North Dakota, for example, the percentage of gas being flared compared to what's being produced was significantly higher. And then as the state put some things in place to, like you said, encourage closed loop systems. But you know what's doing that? That's the separation that's coming past bubble point. That's that's really just in order to get the liquid, you need the gas. You know, it's the it's the drive mechanism. And then at a certain pressure, you're having that separation. So whatever the ratio is, I don't know what the general one is up in North Dakota, but you wouldn't be able to meet your production requirements without that level of flaring. True. So gas oil ratios will increase. Mm -hmm. And I guess what, what we didn't plan for 
which is probably part of not um, being innovative or um, looking forward enough. What we didn't plan for is what do I do with the gas? And I think um, I'm, I'm I'm hoping that some someone will come in with a ton of money and start capturing all of this gas and convert it to energy because that's that's essentially what we're in. So we we're in the oil and gas industry, but at the end of the day, the consumers consume energy with mm-hmm. the in the form of um, converting it to kinetic energy to drive around, converting it to electricity. We are in the energy business and gas can be converted to energy. So I would rather have the gas converted to energy in some way than have it fled. But having said that, I'm not going to shut down Mm-mm. livelihoods. So what is being missed in this portion of the conversation? Because, you know, a flare stack looks kind of scary. It's a great picture. It's a great headline. But how do we normalize this conversation so that it's a productive one and what needs to be understood from one side to the other, from your experience? So I think, uh, it, 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 it comes to collaboration. Again, I think the energy companies, now when just say and gas companies, energy companies need to come together and figure out what does it cost to, reduce flaring or eliminate flaring if possible. Now, I I like the solar industry. It's all, it's all renewable, it's all energy, but um, would I, what do I gain if I have a huge solar field to supply me electricity while I flare gas? Maybe Maybe you should address that question from what do you lose because it all comes down to surface right issues. Exactly. So what do I lose if I invest in solar versus a gas power plant? It depends how long the subsidies last. There you go. So do we chase subsidy or do we all come together and fight climate change? (laughs) Because if we're all going after this for the subsidies, then everyone's just going to do what's convenient for them. It's more convenient to go for solar panels because you get subsidies at the same time, I'll burn gas. It's the same energy company. There are companies who do that. You see solar panels everywhere while we flare gas. Well, see, so, your point there, then the subsidies create a Ponzi scheme on the alternatives, which means really there's no issue with the alternatives combating climate change because even the Paris Accord said that oil and gas operations were neutral in the effects of climate change. So you really need to look at the source there instead of chasing the media narrative. I agree, I agree. So rather than follow what media says or say do what makes you feel happy, let's just look at the facts out there. Yeah, what do you need to be pissed off about today? Yeah, so personally, if I if I had a business and I had something I could use, I wouldn't go I wouldn't go buy electricity from someone else if I could generate my own. You would build a microgrid. Something like that. What would be your solution on this flaring stuff? You like oh, markets. I don't. I ah uh, like I said, I would love to see all of the gas converted to energy or converted some form of, um, Equino tried something in the back end in June. I haven't followed uh, to see what the results are, but at some point they had a Bitcoin mining truck. Bitcoin, Um, what is a Bitcoin mining truck? So Bitcoin is cryptocurrency. Yeah, but that means it's like, it's not physical, It's, it's not, it's not like a dollar. It's literally some no. sort of microchip on the internet. It is digital money. Okay. And whether we like it uh, or not, at some point, um, we need to give consumers what they want, right? Consumers, our world is going towards cryptocurrency, data analytics, artificial intelligence, electric vehicles. We cannot deny the fact that there's a, portion of the market that demand something. Yeah, but doesn't it seem like buzzwords and no action? Well, I, uh, 
I think at some point, our current form of in technology is going to take over with something else. And I think cryptocurrency is probably the way, one of the ways. Now, I don't think it's going to be tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of inf- infrastructure that needs to be put in place. But if why, if you can, why not go in early? If it's a waste, at least you haven't fled gas. Well, yeah, so let's go back. How are you hooking up to some sort of flare stack with a cryptocurrency truck? Oh, oh no, 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 no. What's happening there? So a cryptocurrency truck, like cryptocurrency, yeah. so Bitcoin mining requires a lot of energy. That's why I don't do it. Because if I buy Bitcoin mining- like Personal money. energy. Exactly. If I plug that into my house, my electricity bill will run to the roof. Yeah. Right. But if you you can set up a gas plant that takes the gas from your wells, compresses it, turns into a generator and generate electricity for something that mines bitcoins, which as of today, one Bitcoin is maybe $10,000. Uh, you've somehow converted your gas to money, money. And if it becomes money, it's fine. If it doesn't become money, you haven't fled gas. I guess m- my point is there, uh, flaring, is a, flaring is the easy solution. There are difficult solutions we could tackle out, we could, we could take on, but are we ready for it? Would it be an option for CO2? Well, if you just capture the gas and re-inject it, capture, it's, that's the thing. It all requires some sort of investment at the current prices of energy. Are we able to do that economically without subsidy? Mm-hmm. Or should we move energy policy in a way that, you know, this is a requirement for me to get my, like you said, in order to produce oil, which the demand is low right now, in order to produce any oil, I need to flip this amount of gas. Um, I don't have the resources to capture this gas. Can I get some subsidy? Can I get some tax rebates? Can I get something to help me out? Well, California was supposed to offer subsidies on uh, ethane, and they never came through. No one ever qualified for it. It was a false deal. So let's, I can't, I can't vote here, but yeah, for those who can't go vote for someone who will do what they promise. (laughs) Well, actually on that point, I don't actually think listening to uh, the energy platforms and they're becoming more prevalent now, they kind of died off with the COVID for a little bit, you know, it wasn't the hot topic, but they are slowly but surely making the rounds. And I can't say that either uh, candidate is truly looking at what it means to produce energy in this country. And they most definitely don't understand the idea behind controlling the global tap. So it's almost like American energy security is an absolute farce. So what are you, what are you seeing? You know, like you said, you can't vote here. Sorry, Canada. (laughs) Sorry, Africa. (laughs) But you have such a good perspective. You're able to take a step back and not get caught up in the rigmarole. So what are you noticing about these energy policies? What can we do better? Yeah, you said neither candidate has proposed something that satisfies you or satisfies the industry. And I guess my pushback would be whose fault is that? Like, I think it's industry. We went so damn PC that we lost our voice. And you know what's boring? PC. Because everyone loses their personality and you can't be afraid to have a difficult or a crucial conversation. They call it crucial conversations. And then we'll find a candidate who's willing to listen. And then you'll vote. No, I should just run for office. What do you think about that? You've dealt with me for two years now. I think uh, I think you'll make a good congresswoman. Oh, Congress, not president. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Do your four to eight years oh. and then run for president. I'm gonna. I'll be fifty. Um. <laughs> the current the current candidates are in their seventies, so you're very young. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the touche B, good point. Um, but what are you noticing about energy policy? Where are we missing the conversation? 
or where are we missing the importance of the conversation rather? Uh, I think, I think y y you've touched on it earlier. I think it's the fact that um, we've just been so busy in the business of producing oil and gas. I think we've probably lost a bit of focus on what the consumers want. The consumers want energy. They want ease. No yeah. one wants to look at impact. Exactly. So, And yet Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, well, I guess that's the same thing. So yeah, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google have all made very political statements about not willing to work with dirty sources of energy anymore. And yet oil and gas is not a dirty source of energy. If anything, we leave it better than we found it. Now, do we have a great history? No, but we embrace it and we have learned from it. So, so I did, I dare say that, um, a lot of these, a lot of companies are run like there's, I, uh, there's a social responsibility, but at the end of the day, the bottom line counts. If, that's the thing that's lost on engineers. They don't think about business. Yeah. If we can convert, uh, oil and gas to electricity, at 0 0.1 cents per kilowatt, there will be server farms in Midland. The cloud will be in Midland, <laughs> right? Well, so that's like, that's the way I see it. If you can't, if we can provide what they actually need, what Microsoft needs for the cloud, what Amazon needs for its cloud, what Google needs for its cloud, what Facebook needs for their cloud, if we can provide We've got oil and gas, yay. But if we can't provide electricity from it, just you know, go one level up the value chain or two levels up the value chain and say, if you move to Midland, you've got electricity at alpha cent a kilowatt. You will call the server rooms. It will be way cheaper than wherever else you're putting the servers right now. There will be pushback. But when you look at the bottom line and you actually look at what you save in the fact, for example, if we do that, for example, I guess we probably won't have to flare any gas. What would it take to convert Texas? I don't know. Well, I mean, that was the whole point of this podcast. You should know. <laughs> I, I wish I did. I'm not, I'm not texting yet. Out of this pivot, we are seeing a crew change. I mean, that's inevitable. And um, I'm starting to talk about it more and more with my influencers because it directly affects my future in industry. What I can't really talk about yet, and I was curious your part is, or your perspective is, are we evolving? We're seeing the introduction of digital media. We're seeing a push for collaboration and more digestible and transparent data with um, external sources of industry, but are our ideas really changing? Are we rethinking the face of an oil and gas company service or production side? I mean, is, have we gained anything or are we chasing our own tail? I mean, if you had to go into upper management, what, what would you present on? What would you say, hey, look, I've been here. I've been on all of these countries. This is our opportunity. This is where we need to pivot. So I think, yeah, I think um, we're being left behind on so many fronts. I think, I think the, uh, yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm part of the industry, so I own this as well. I'm not putting the blame on anyone. I know you have to, you have to be nice about everything or I'll get you fired. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think we've innovated fast enough. And what and that could be applied to several several portions of our industry. So can you be a little more specific? So so let's um, let's step out to a very controversial industry. Let's look at the the auto industry, cars. Okay. okay. Tesla came up a few years ago with electric vehicles, and there was a huge pushback. And, oh, electric vehicles will never make it. They'll never get batteries enough. They'll never do this. They'll never do that. Um, I think that was probably one of the uh, the biggest mistakes of the competition because 
whether we like it or not, consumers like electric vehicles. It's a feel good factor, but when you break down the back end of electric vehicles, they like them for the wrong reasons. Um, so what, what wrong reasons? Oh, you're reducing oil and gas, but on the other side, you're doing mountaintop mm -hmm. removal. <laughs> Right. So by the so, way, charging your electric vehicle requires a diesel generator. So we um, only like to look as far as our feel good lets us. So 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 that's the thing. But in spite of all that, people still love. I, if you ride in the Tesla, it's a really nice car. You should test. You should go, you, you, you should you should go for a test drive. No, I have a Forerunner. I'm happy. You should go for a test drive. You might. <laughs> I can't afford one, but it's a really, really smooth car. Mm -hmm. right? And when you see innovation, and that's that's where I said, like when there's innovation, you don't you don't fight it. You own it, and you you take over, so you can control it. Correct. I think in terms of the renewable space, we don't need to fight it. We just need to own it and become energy companies. There's nothing wrong with having a solar panel right next to your well head if you're not. We there. already do. That's yeah, the part that's that. lost on the public is the alternatives, which are just energy sources and oil and gas have been integrated for about really two fine. decades and yeah. quite heavily. True. And and so, so that's the thing, I, I guess, my my point is you can't do that and still be wasteful or be seen as wasteful. Okay. Because when, yeah, when it comes to flaring, it's been seen as oh, it's a waste, it's destroying the planet, and all the all the the um, the narrative out there. But the truth is, it's something you need to get something else. Mm -hmm. I think we need to innovate faster to whether we like it or not. It's the consumers that dictate what they're gonna buy. Right, but if you make it cheap enough, and you 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 present a better deal, you'll win the market. So even though consumers, I would say the biggest problem with consumers is they don't like they don't like the idea of flaring. They don't like the idea of drilling or fracking, but they also don't like looking back at their impact, their footprint. And you know what powers Amazon Prime? <laughs> fossil fuels. <laughs> so to your point about getting ahead and innovating, I mean, it, it goes both ways, but only one side has to compromise. And the oil and gas industry has, I would say, has done a very good job of compromising to the point where we've almost lost our voice. So that's the thing. If you're, if you're seeing, and that I didn't say if you are, if you are seen as the one who's got the upper hand and you don't have a way to change that narrative, the underdog is going to beat you up because everyone's going to think you're a bully. Mm -hmm. So the oil and gas industry has always upper hand is the industry that's making tons of money. But a few weeks ago, um, one of the most valuable companies at some point in the world got kicked off. Dow Jones, right, after 100 years. Uh, when things like that happen, you've, you've essentially lost your power, but people still, the consumers still see you as the big guy. You're no longer big. You're no longer big, but you're still the brand recognition. How's that? Exactly. Your brand still connotes size and influence, even though you've potentially lost a huge portion of it. So it's time to rebrand, it's time to innovate, it's time to take over with the capital on hand. Mm -hmm. And it is possible, it is possible. We can, I think, um, I think BP is doing a great job of rebranding and becoming- and Beyond becoming, petroleum. <laughs> becoming an energy company. I think uh, consumers are beginning to, um, gravitate more towards a whole BB's nice. I think we could all do that. And because whether we like it or not, we, we're not drilling for oil and gas so we can drink it. 
with drilling so we could sell it to someone. Yeah, it's the business of money. Exactly. So if you have a restaurant and all you serve is steak and people keep saying, I want fish. Then kick them out. Yeah, you kick them out and then someone opens up a fish store right next door. <laughs> yeah. Don't get mad if they go buy fish. You don't think what BP, Shell, Total, they're all doing is a version of false greenwashing for a, uh, honestly, just to combat a headline narrative? Because they're still petroleum. That's still their primary business. I don't care that they say they're beyond petroleum. They've still got active wells and they haven't pulled out of North America as fast as they damn well wanted. And they're still paying restitutions from a condo. So I'm sorry, but you're still oil and gas. And why are you not proud of it? Because oil and gas uplifts every other industry. We are the reason for a green movement. Why would you not promote that narrative? Because so you're sick of fighting it? So let me let me push back on that. Yeah. If, we, if we are the reason for the green movement, if we enable the green movement, why don't we own the green movement? Why is the green exactly. movement right now? Like how did that happen? How do you how do you go from a place of power to a place where you look like you're the helpless bully on the playground? because of grassroots movements, because of marketing schemes. And honestly, this leads to a really good question because everyone is very focused on ESG. We're very focused on this narrative and no one wants to look at the numbers and look at the facts and look how, I mean, hell, Colorado's air outside of the fires right now, but it is the cleanest it has ever been. And that's because of oil and gas ingenuity. No one else, no other industry came in to do that. And yet we are getting grilled throughout the Rockies on more and uh, more stringent air regulations. So B, why is the narrative, the facts, the data not landing? Yeah, so yeah, I think before the fact, so if, like, like I said, if you if you're the big guy out there, even if you're not big, if you're seen as a big guy out there, you need to understand that it's you're going to be the one everyone wants to pull down, right? So before you get pulled down, you we this this is something like the messaging is where we missed out because we were so busy working on serving and making sure everyone had light, everyone could. Everyone had electricity, everyone could have a warm room to sleep in, everyone could drive and fly to wherever they wanted to fly to, and we're being paid for it, we're being compensated and some way for it. We did not take time to brand ourselves for this change. But it's not it's it's not too late. It's it's gonna keep happening. No one's gonna come back and say, Oh, now I see what oil and gas has benefited me. I'm sorry. That doesn't happen. Mm -mm. We just need to own it. Too late. We need to own it and rewrite the narrative. So we are in a crew change. We're seeing those with honestly less than 10 years of experience being forced into managerial roles that they haven't even had to go back to the science because of the, the shale uh, processes that were in place and how we measured, you know, best in basin comparisons and statistics. And it's it's a new game now. We're having to go back to fundamentals and honestly relearn the science. So how does this new narrative that we have the opportunity to steer affect this great crew change? So I guess for, for everyone who's a part of the change, if you're in a place of responsibility, I think you have the responsibility to know your business. So we might have missed out on the training. We might have missed out on it from school. We might have missed out on it in the early days of our careers because we're so busy. But, you know, the science is out there. The papers are out there. The material is out there. Yeah, but if a paper's had more than five authors, you know only one person wrote it. So come on. Yeah. Are, are really Is SPE really providing a a library of use at this point because even Bob Burry will come in and say most of the papers written are absolute shit because we don't require peer review. I, I agree with that. So I, I believe SP has got a peer review mechanism. It's not it's not being used as much as it should be used because of volume and you need to you know <clears throat> we need to fill the 
fill the conference slots. I, I think um, I think everything is going digital. I SP, think you just answered my question, fill the conference slots. <laughs> SP, SP is getting replaced gradually by LinkedIn. By, uh, by podcasters, by those breaking out separate and not following the way we've always done it. Exactly. I think SP, this is, so yeah, when we talk about rebranding and all that, SP is one of the organizations that could have driven this conversation and rebranded the industry. But yeah, we, we've been busy. Like uh, I see, I still see conferences, like virtual conferences that SP asks people to, you know, pay to attend. Yes, we need to fund SPE, but right now we need to get more innovative and creative about how to disseminate the knowledge and make sure the knowledge that's going out there is, like you said, true science, not just something that's written to promote a certain technology that's- To probably, make a sale. Yeah, or just make a sale. And the, the industry grew so fast and grew way grew so fast that academia is struggling to um to catch up right so <clears throat> well most you, who graduate i mean it's great four years is awesome mm -hmm. but when you get out all you know are acronyms exactly. you don't deserve a you know six-figure salary yeah you have, so no, you have no credibility and and when that happens, you the 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 credibility of the industry as a whole starts to starts to erode because you like like you said you come out in a bunch of acronyms not really understanding the business of oil and gas and in ten years or you start with a six figure salary in ten years or in a management position you still know nothing because essentially your entire ten year career is probably being just sourcing for water for a frack crew, mm -hmm. or you can do that so well. So I'd say you're probably a great project manager. Um, you're a good sourcing manager for water, but you're not a you're not a subsurface engineer, a subsurface manager, because you don't understand the science. You know how to get things out of the ground, but you don't know how we got there, why it got there, and what's the right technology to apply there based on some sort of learning so yeah uh, i think we we have a lot of work to do on that and yeah the crew change needs to be managed carefully because if the um if the new crew doesn't understand the business it's going to crash and burn faster than it is right now so that's actually kind of interesting that you pulled that up because i know this is this is sort of modeled after our typical mentor sessions, we come up with, I come to you with questions about what I'm seeing in industry, subsurface, what have you, and kind of do my best to argue with you along the way. But, you know, I'm curious what you're seeing with uh, what's actually making up an engineer, because some people get into this industry and you, I mean, it takes like a few years to realize, do they have the cojones to be an engineer? Are they thinking like an engineer? Um, compensation in the industry is probably something we should talk about. I am one to, I believe that compensation needs to be attached to value. Well, yes, no. that would be, but everyone would say that to some capacity. Yeah. So would you accept that your salary be pegged to oil prices? Oil prices drive the flow of industry, I think almost everyone I've talked to has had a reduction in salary because of the black swans. Right. Because of the black swans, not the regular up and down. So what I'm saying is if your job adds a hundred barrels of oil value to your company, would you accept a hundred barrels of oil as compensation, say every year? because it might be 20 bucks, might be a hundred bucks, might be negative on some days. I don't might think if we took that approach, anyone would come to, into industry. That's where I'm going. So um, the industry attracted a lot of people because of money, mm -hmm. because it pays generously. Now, a few come in and actually develop a passion for the industry. Okay. And 
those are the ones who stay on. Those are the ones who want to learn the business, who want to understand why am I doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. There's the other side who are in it for the money. When the money is there, it's great. When the money is not there, I'm out. And then you curse out all your managers because, oh, they're terrible people. They were never nice to me. But you need to understand the business you're in is a cyclical one. And in order for your firm to survive, you have to be innovative. But we go back again over the last 10 years, there's been really no need to innovate in anything. We just get pumping and get in the, get in the oil and gas out. So when, when things like this happen, um, you have to understand that, yeah, your value hasn't really changed. So when oil becomes negative, you should pay your company for paying you because your values to extract oil. <laughs> so you see, you see my point, you, you, you need to be in the industry because you really love it. And I know there are a ton of people out there who really love the industry or they want to understand the science, who are tired of, you know, cookie cutter type um, operations, who want to do things because this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I hope the crew change has a lot of those people in it and the, the industry will move forward. Whether we like it or not though, the consumers of energy will keep asking for clean energy, whether it's for- uh, I don't think we'll be able to meet that because there's no definition and there's no desire to learn what clean actually is. Right, so I'd say what, you, what we need to do is provide an alternative energy to the alternative energy. Mm -hmm. If we sell our energy, because um, I think it's, it, it, it just, it, it will take a little bit of innovation, but oil and gas can be converted to, and I'll just use one form of energy. Oil and gas can be converted to electricity and provided to the users at a cheaper rate. And when I say cheaper, I'm also factoring in subsidies at a cheaper rate to the national economy. And I think it's just common sense to follow the money. And I don't see how we don't win. Like if I come to the market with a cheaper source of energy that I can prove that it's just as clean as the other source of energy, it will be discrimination if you say, no, I still want this one and I don't want yours. At that point, we have a voice. Mm -hmm. Right now, when we present what we have, it is seen as dirty and it destroys the climate. And we don't have the right message and the, the data, the facts out there to say, no, it doesn't. Even when we do, the consumers have already been biased to the point where they don't believe it. Right? So yeah, we we have a lot of work and I, I, I don't know all the answers. I don't know what needs to be up. I know we need to innovate and step up, step up from, hey, here's oil and gas, go do whatever you want to do with it to, hey, here's electricity, go. Hey, here's a warm house, live in. Hey, here's a huge room that's cool to negative 100 degrees C, exaggeration, bring all your servers and this is all I'll charge you. I think that's where, um, that's how the industry will will survive with a good image. Uh, but I, I honestly don't buy into the pushback and say, yeah, what they're saying is rubbish. You can't, you can't blame a kid who doesn't know any better. You, we haven't told them what we actually do. We haven't, mm -hmm. we don't have a message that tells how clean oil and gas is relative to wind or relative to to solar and if we're telling them now it's a little bit too late because it, well it's a little bit late it's not too it's, it's never too late it's late because we it's it's a, you're already being perceived as a big guy who just wants to force something down everyone's throat mm -hmm. the bully yeah well b as we wrap up this conversation you know you took us from the mergers that are happening through fracking and flaring and those hot button topics that are resurfacing again uh, for one reason or another. And, you know, your history has definitely been expertise and subsurface from reservoir to production, honestly. 
So knowing what I do, knowing how you've trained me over the last couple of years, when I'm sitting around a table speaking to my upper management, if you were in the room, where would you be telling me to uh, start putting some focus, start making sure I have a voice here, start making sure I'm paying attention to this side, given the state of our industry? I'd say probably one of the one of the things we don't talk about enough is, and let's go back to fracture and all that we don't talk about enough is um, what 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 moves the needle, right? What uh, do you really know your rock? Mm -hmm. Do you really know how many clusters you need? Yeah. Did you really improve? <laughs> exactly. Is this optimized, or are we just you doing it as a buzzword. Exactly. So if you if you do what everybody else does and you get a worse result, the problem is not in the way you did it or in what you did. You just didn't do what was right for you. Mm -hmm. So if I was in the room with you, what I would say is understand what is right for your rock. Now it 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 might be a tough sell if it's not what everyone else is doing. Also, science costs money. Science costs money, but there's value in the science, right? If the cost per barrel is $50 and you could bring it down to 25 with a $5 investment in science, I don't think your management will kick you out of the room. I think you'll get promoted. I'm promoted. Yeah, but right now it's very easy to say, oh, I looked over there, this is what this guy is doing. Let's do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then you do that. Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, why didn't it work? And then you start looking. Oh, maybe the geologist told us the wrong place to land. Maybe the drillers did this. Maybe no. No, it's uh, like spend some time to know what is what what is in your asset. What what is it? And, and I, I guess very few, very few, and even us as premier, I've been a collaboration space that covers the entire Permian Basin now. We see differences from the north to the south, the east to the west. Mm -hmm. And what we're developing is a recipe for different classes of rock. That'll always be evolving, though. The more yeah. data you get, I mean, not necessarily big data is not good data necessarily, but the more data you get, the more evolution that happens. But isn't that what we want? Don't we want to evolve and we want to learn? Do we just want one secret source and says, this is a nail, here's a hammer, keep banking and everything. Um, and that's how industry has performed up to this point. Which is why we're where we are today. <laughs> <laughs> well, B, I think moving forward, we should tape all of our mentor sessions. <laughs> okay, so I loved having this conversation with you. I, I Again, I also hated it because I don't want people to know how good of a mentor you are. <laughs> But B, thank you so much for sitting down, chatting through some current events, talking about thank fracturing. You. You've seen more than most people could dream to see in their entire careers. And I think that makes you a really unique asset to the oil field. And I would recommend anyone looking for a true, honest subsurface evaluation, get in touch with you because like you said, there is a pushback towards the science, but the science has to meet the economics. And I think you actually have firsthand in doing that. So I look forward to our next mentor session. Uh, maybe uh, I'll let you tear me up a little bit more instead of going after uh, some news articles. Yeah, next time I'll have the mic. <laughs> Lord have mercy, I'm going to get so screwed. Um, <laughs> but I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much. But before you go, what is a book, podcast, or other resource that you would recommend that's brought you value on your journey? I will send you a long list. Okay. And then you I'll can put it in the show notes then. Yeah. 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 Let you me see. Links in there also. All right. Cool. <laughs> But otherwise, thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation, and I'm glad I finally got you on a solo interview. Thank you. It's, been fun. <laughs> it's always fun. It's always fun. All right, cool. I will talk okay. to you later, and you have a good rest of your evening. You too. Okay. All right.